The Problems of Philosophy, Chapter 11, on Intuitive Knowledge. There is a common impression that everything that we believe ought to be capable of proof, or at least of being shown to be highly probable. It is felt by many that a belief for which no reason can be given is an unreasonable belief. In the main, this view is just. Almost all of our common beliefs are either inferred or are capable of being inferred from other beliefs which may be regarded as giving the reason for them. As a rule, the reason has been forgotten or has never even been consciously present to our mind. Few of us ever ask ourselves, for example, what reason there is to suppose the food we are just going to eat will not turn out to be poison. Yet we feel, when challenged, that a perfectly good reason could be found, even if we are not ready with it at the moment. And in this belief, we are usually justified. But let us imagine some instance of Socrates, who, whatever reason we gave him, continues to demand a reason for the reason. We must sooner or later, and probably before very long, be driven to a point where we cannot find any further reason, and where it becomes almost certain that no further reason is even theoretically discoverable. Starting with the common beliefs of daily life, we can be driven back from point on point until we come to some general principle, or some instance of a general principle, which seems luminously evident and is not itself capable of being deduced from anything more evident. In most questions of daily life, such as whether our food is likely to be nourishing and not poisonous, we shall be driven back to the inductive principle, which we discussed in chapter 6. But beyond that, there seems to be no further progress. The principle itself is constantly used in our reasoning, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. But there is no reasoning which, starting from simpler self-evident principle, leads us to the principle of induction as its conclusion. And the same holds for other logical principles. Their truth is evident to us, and we employ them in constructing demonstrations, but they themselves, or at least some of them, are incapable of demonstration. Self-evidence, however, is not confined to those among general principles which are incapable of proof. When a certain number of logical principles have been admitted, the rest can be deduced from them but the propositions deduced are often just as self-evident as those that were assumed without proof. All arithmetic, moreover, can be deduced from general principles of logic, yet the simple propositions of arithmetic, such as 2 and 2 and 4, are just as self-evident as the principles of logic. It would seem also, though this is more disputable, that there are some self-evident ethical principles, such as we ought to pursue which is good. It should be observed that, in all cases of general principles, particular instances dealing with familiar things are more evident than general principle. For example, the law of contradiction states that nothing can both have a certain property and not have it. This is evident as soon as it is understood, but it is not so evident that, that a particular rose which we see cannot be both red and not red. It is, of course, possible that parts of the rose may be red and parts not red or that the rose may be a shade of pink, which we can hardly know whether to call red or not. But in the former case, it is plain that the rose as a whole is not red, while in the later case, the answer is theoretically definite as soon as we have decided on a precise definition of red. It is usually through particular instances that we come to be able to see the general principle. Only those who are practiced in dealing with abstractions can readily grasp a general principle without the help of instances. In addition to general principles, the other kind of self-evident truths are those immediately derived from sensation. We will call such truths truths of perception, and the judgment expressing them we will call judgments of perception. But here, a certain amount of care is required in getting at the precise nature of the truths that are self-evident. The actual sense data are neither true nor false. A particular patch of color, which I see, for example, simply exists. It is not the sort of thing that is true or false. It is true that there is such a patch. True that it has a certain shape and degree of brightness. True that it is surrounded by certain other colors. But the patch itself, like everything else in the world of sense, 
is of a radically different kind from the things that are true or false, and therefore cannot properly be said to be true. Thus, whatever self-evident truths may be obtained from our senses must be different from the sense data from which they are obtained. It would seem that there are two kinds of self-evident truths of perception, though perhaps in the last analysis, the two kinds may coalesce. First, there is the kind which simply asserts the existence of the sense data without in any way in analyzing it. We see a patch of red and we judge there is such and such a patch of red, or more strictly, there is that. This is one kind of intuitive judgment of perception. The other kind arises when the object of sense is complex and we subject it to some degree of analysis. If, for instance, we see a round patch of red, we may judge that patch of red is round. This is, again, a judgment of perception, but it differs from our previous kind. In our previous kind, we have a single sense data which has both color and shape. The color is red and the shape is round. Our judgment anal analyzes the datum into color and shape and then recombines them by stating that the red color is round in shape. Another example of this kind of judgment is this is to the right of that, where this and that are seen simultaneously. In this kind of judgment, the sense data contains constituents which have some relation to each other, and the judgment asserts that these constituents have this relation. Another class of intuitive judgments, analogous to those of sense, and yet quite distinct from them, are judgments of memory. There is some danger of confusion as to the nature of memory, owing to the fact that memory of an object is apt to be accompanied by an image of the object, and yet the image cannot be what constitutes memory. This is easily seen by merely noticing that the image is in the present, whereas when it is remembered, it is known to be in the past. Moreover, we are certainly able to some extent to compare our image with the object remembered so that we often know within somewhat wide limits how far our image is accurate. But this would be impossible unless the object as opposed to the image were in some way before the mind. Thus, the essence of memory is not constituted by the image, but by having immediately before the mind an object which is recognized as past. But for the fact that memory, in this sense, we should not know that there ever was a past at all, nor should we be able to understand the word past any more than a man born blind can understand the word light. Thus, there must intuit be intuitive judgments of memory, and it is upon them, ultimately, that all our knowledge of the past depends. The case of memory, however, raises a difficulty for it is notoriously fallacious, and thus throws doubt on the trustworthiness of intuitive judgments in general. This difficulty is no light one, but let us first narrow its scope down as far as possible. Broadly speaking, memory is trustworthy in proportion to the vividness of the experience and to its nearness in time. If the house next door was struck by lightning half a minute ago, my memory of what I saw and heard will be so reliable that it would be presumptuous to doubt whether there had been a flash at all. And the same applies to less vivid experiences, so long as they are recent. I am absolutely certain that half a minute ago, I was sitting in the same chair in which I am sitting now. Going backward over the day, I find things of which I am quite certain, other things of which I am almost certain, and other things of which I can become certain by thought and by calling up attendant circumstances and some things of which I am by no means certain. I am quite certain that I ate my breakfast this morning, but if I were as indifferent to my breakfast as a philosopher should be, I should be doubtful. As to the conversation at breakfast, I can recall some of it easily, some with an effort, and some only with a large element of doubt, and some not at all. Thus, there is a continual gradation in the degree of self-evidence of what I remember, and a corresponding gradation in the trustworthiness of my memory. Thus, the first answer to the difficulty of fallacious memory is to say that memory has degrees of self-evidence, and that these correspond to the degrees of its trustworthiness, reaching a limit of perfect self-evidence and perfect trustworthiness in our memory of events which are recent and vivid. It would seem, however, that there are cases of very firm belief in a memory which is wholly false. It is probable that, in these cases, what is really remembered 
in the sense of being immediately before the mind, is something other than what is falsely believed in, though something generally associated with it. George the Fourth is said to have at last believed that he was at the Battle of Waterloo because he had so often said that he was. In this case, what was immediately remembered was his repeated assertion. The belief in what he was asserting, if it existed, would be produced by association with the remembered assertion and would therefore not be a genuine case of memory. It would seem that cases of fallacious memory can probably all be dealt with in this way, i.e. they can show to be not cases of memory in a strict sense at all. One important point about self-evidence is made clear in the case of memory, and that is that self-evidence has degrees. It is not a quality which is simply present or absent, but a quality which may be more or less present in gradations ranging from absolute certainty down to an almost imperceptible faintness. Truths of perception and some of the principles of logic have the very highest degree of self-evidence. Truths of immediate memory have an almost equally high degree. The inductive principle has less self-evidence than some of the other principles of logic, such as what follows from a true premise must be true. Memories have a diminishing self-evidence as they become remoter and fainter. The truths of logic and mathematics have, broadly speaking, less self-evidence as they become more complicated. Judgments of intrinsic ethical or aesthetic value are apt to have some self-evidence, but not much. Degrees of self-evidence are important in the theory of knowledge, since if prepositions may, as seems likely, have some degree of self-evidence without being true, it will not be necessary to abandon all connection between self-evidence and truth, but merely to say that where there is conflict, the more self-evident proposition is to be retained and the less self-evident rejected. It seems, however, highly probable that two different notions are combined in self-evidence as above explained, that one of them, which corresponds to the highest degree of self-evidence, is really an infallible guarantee of truth, while the other, which corresponds to all the other degrees, does not give an infallible guarantee, but only a greater or less presumption. This, however, is only suggestion, which we cannot as yet develop further. After we have dealt with the nature of truth, we shall return to the subject of self-evidence, in connection with the distinction between knowledge and error.